Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about how to analyze the lasso estimator. The prerequisites for this material are sparse regression via the lasso, convexity, and subgradients. We're going to analyze an additive model where there's a true vector of coefficients, there's a fixed feature matrix, and some additive random noise, okay? And that, that, that is what yields the response. This, very sim this is exactly the same model that we analyzed for um, OLS, rich regression and um, regularization via early stopping. Here we're going to uh, incorporate some new assumptions in order to gain intuition about why the lasso promotes sparse solutions. In particular, we're going to consider a super simple model where there's just one true feature. And that true feature is corrupted by some additive noise, and that's what gives you the response. However, we don't know that that's the true feature. There's this other feature that we think might be relevant, which we call the X other, and we include it in the model. So now think for a moment what the true vector of coefficients should be in this case, so that we get this model. And the true vector of coefficients is 1, 0. Okay, so we're going to start by decomposing the lasso cost function in a very similar way to what we did with OLS, rich regression, and early stopping, uh, and gradient descent, sorry, um, regularization via early stopping. We're going to first um, separate the um, least squares part of the cost function into a quadratic form that is centered at beta true and then has this noise component. And on the other hand, we're going to consider the L1 part for the simple example that I just explained. Okay, so here we have, as you can see, beta true is, um, um, is sparse, okay, and the coefficients are equal to 1 and 0. And, well, you see here the typical contour lines for uh, a quadratic that depends on a certain sample covariance matrix. Presumably, uh, the singular value in the so the the singular vectors or yeah the singular vectors of the feature matrix are in these directions and the singular value for this direction is probably smaller okay uh, which is why you have uh, a bigger spread in that direction okay so this is the um the contour lines of the l1 norm regularization term and what we see is that when we combine both, there's an effect where basically the contour lines have a kink here. Maybe I'll draw this with another. So they have a kink here that essentially is going to, um, as we will see, um, draw the possible minima. Like, well, they're going to kind of force the minima to be on this line. The minima when we add some noise, we'll see in a moment. But for now, what happens is that the minimum of the cost function moves from beta true towards zero. Okay, that's bad, but at least it stays sparse. So we see here that it moves towards zero on this axis, so that beta lasso, even though it's not equal to beta true, at least it's a sparse vector. Of course, we still have to incorporate the noise term. And then what happens when we incorporate a, a noise term is quite interesting. If we look at the OLS minimum with respect to the lasso minimum, neither of them are equal to beta true. Um, both of them kind of dance around depending on the realization of the noise. But the lasso tends to be sparse. Then the second entry tends to be zero, whether that is never the case for the OLS estimator. And again, that's due to this interesting geometry of the um, cost function, uh, which is achieved by adding this term. Okay, so now let's take a look at uh, many uh, minima of the cost function obtained by sampling the noise over and over again. And what we see here is uh, quite a bit of variance in this direction because of the small single value. Uh, so it's important to indicate here lambda is zero, so this is closer to the OLS. Uh, this is close to what you would obtain with OLS. When you start increasing lambda, the variance 
um, decreases and the um, center of the points starts moving towards the origin. What's interesting also is that many of these minima for many realization organoids, they're actually sparse. And if we increase um, lambda even further, they're even sparser, okay? except in, in a couple of ex exceptions. They're almost all sparse. And uh, the estimator becomes even more biased okay? um, towards the origin. And eventually, you, you get almost to the origin, and everything is super sparse. So there's two effects here. When we increase lambda, we increase the bias but reduce the variance. So there's a bias variance trade-off, just like what we have for retrogression or early stopping. But also, very quickly, we start getting sparse solutions, so solutions that lie on this line. And that's important because those solutions have, uh, like the, the second coefficient is zero for those solutions, which means that the lasso estimator is able to detect the relevant feature. It performs model selection correctly. Okay, and now we're going to try to prove that this is the case for this very simple model. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to just assume there's um, deterministic noise. So the noise is not no longer going to be random. We're just going to make some assumptions on the deterministic noise. And we're going to fit a model that has an adi like the additional feature x other and the true vector question. So everything is the same except that now we're considering the noise deterministic. And we're going to assume that the two features are normalized so that they have um, L2 norm equal to 1. Okay, just to be clear, this is an n-dimensional vector of responses in the training set. So this is the n, an n-dimensional vector of the, uh, containing the examples of the true feature. And this is an n-dimensional vector of noise, which again we consider deterministic. So we're going to prove the following result. We're going to prove that if lambda is in a certain range, then the lasso coefficient estimate is equal to this. Okay, so now let's take a look first why um, it's interesting that the lasso is equal to this. What's interesting is that it's sparse, okay? So the second entry is zero, and the first entry, okay, has the right. Um, um, has the right sign. So, so basically model selection is performed well. The, the lasso estimator actually realizes that, well, or allows us to realize that the, true co uh, the, the, um, the relevant feature is the first one. Okay, so now let's look at this expression, which is a bit complicated. It depends on the correlation between the features and the correlation between the noise and each of the two features. The reason why we have this dependence on the correlation between the noise and the true features is that if the noise is correlated with the true features, then you, it is quite reasonable, maybe, if, especially if that correlation is really high, to think that, um, for example, the other, so, so just to be clear, so we have this model here. If this guy is very correlated with one of the features, it might be reasonable to think that the response is actually um, actually depends on that feature. Okay, in that case, in fact, it might be reasonable to include it in the model. So we want to think of Z as being essentially uncorrelated with the two features. If it's completely uncorrelated with the two features, then what we have here is that lambda needs to be between 0 and 1. Okay? That one looks a bit... We have that lambda would be between 0 and 1, um, which is a pretty large um, which is a pretty large range essentially this range we would find it through cross validation here we're just proving that in that case like in the, uh, within this range okay or this range if we want to look at the general case where the features and the noise are not uncorrelated then the lasso is going to work okay so essentially what we're saying is that when the regularization parameter lambda is between uh, to is, is in this range, we have a coefficient. This coefficient is going to be beta 1, that is non-zero, and the other coefficient, is beta 2, is zero. So if you remember, this is exactly what we saw when we applied the lasso on real data, and there were these coefficients that were appearing 
at some point with Lambda. So obviously when Lambda is, is very, very large, uh, like the solution is just going to be the zero vector. And when Lambda is very small, we're going to get the OLS estimates. But in between, we have this sweet spot where we have sparse uh, coefficient estimates, and this is exactly the same thing that we saw when we applied the lasso on real data. Except that here, well, here we have a very, very simplified model, and we're going to prove that that is actually the case. So how do we prove this? If you remember, our analysis of the OLS estimator and of the rich regression estimator and of the um, early stopping estimator obtained by um, gradient descent, our analysis of, of all of those relied on the fact that we could derive a closed form solution for the coefficient estimate. And this is not possible for the lasso. We just can't. There is no closed form solution. So instead, we're going to, um, you know, think about, well, not think, but we're going to use our knowledge about convex functions as subgradients. And what we're going to do is we're going to show that zero is a subgradient of the lasso cost function at this beta lasso, at a, which is a, which is a one sparse, okay, which has the right sparsity pattern. That's what uh, that that's going to be our strategy. Okay, so in order to um, to follow through with this strategy, we need to derive the subgradients of the lasso cost function. Um, and for that, we're going to derive the subgradients of the two terms, the quadratic term and the L1 norm term, uh, using what we learned in the, um, in the video on subgradients. Um, and then we're going to put them together because as we proved in the video on subgradients, if you have two convex, the sum of two convex functions, a subgradient of the sum is just the sum of, a, of two subgradients, of a subgradient of each of the terms. Okay, so what's the gradient of this quadratic term? It's just exactly equal to the gradient because this is a differentiable function, and we also prove that for differentiable functions, the subgradients are just equal to gradients. Okay, so this is the gradient of the quadratic term. Notice that we have a 1 over 2 here just to make things simpler, like it doesn't matter. And then the subgradient of the L1 norm of the L1 norm at beta lasso, uh, we want to study this subgradient for solutions where the first entry is non-zero and positive. Okay, because beta true, which is the the true vector of coefficients, um, satisfies, I mean, these two things. So the first entry is non-zero and it is positive. So we want to understand under what conditions the lasso estimator allows us to perform model selection, identifying the first entry and identifying that it's positive. Okay, so if that happens, that will be very good news. So we'll have to prove that that is the case, but if that happens, the subgradient has to have a certain uh, form. Now we need to remember that subgradients of the L1 norm for entries that are non-zero are equal to the sign of the entry because essentially that's the derivative of the absolute value of that entry. Okay. And for entries that are zero, it can be any value between minus one and one. Okay. And we, we showed this in the, in the lecture notes and in the video on subgradients. Okay. So if things, if we succeed, um, well, if, if the lasso estimator succeeds, there's going to be like uh, it's, it's subgradient, the subgradient of the L1 norm there will have this form. Okay, if, if again, if beta lasso it has a first entry that is non zero and is positive. Okay, so now we're going to combine both and we're going to get a subgradient of the lasso cost function if this coefficient is, if this vector of coefficients is indeed sparse with the right sparsity pattern. And it's, we just basically need to sum the two subgradients. Okay. So now the idea is that if a sub if if this if there is a subgradient of the lasso cost function at zero, then this means that the corresponding coefficient estimate is a solution. Uh, is a minimum to the lasso cost function because the lasso cost function is convex and under the assumption that x is full rank 
um, is full rank and there's more examples than features, which is definitely the case here because we only have two features, then it's a unique solution. Okay, that's going to be our strategy. So now, in order to implement that strategy, we're going to expand um, the gradient. Okay, um, remember that x is equal to x true and x other transpose. So when we plug this in and beta lasso, we're assuming is equal to some value and zero. Okay, this is the assumption we're making. We're, we're making an assumption that uh, the vector of coefficient uh, is indeed one sparse and the non-zero is in the first entry. That's the assumption we're making and we're gonna check whether um, the cost function indeed has its minimum at, at a point like that. Okay, so we, if we expand this, basically this matrix times this is just going to be beta lasso one times x true, and then we replace y by x true plus z. So now we have that the subgradients, if the solution is, is one sparse, look like this. So now remember that this guy is equal again to x true x other transpose. So that's where this comes from. Okay. This is what the subgradients look like. And now um, we further, I mean, we use the assumption that x true transpose x true is just equal to 1 and x other transpose x true is just equal to rho. Okay, so we get that expression for the subgradient if, again, I want to really stress this, what we're doing is we're assuming that the coefficient vector is one sparse with a non-zero at the first entry. In that case, the subgradients of the L1 norm at that point are going to look like this. And that point is the unique minimum if one of those subgradients is actually equal to zero. So what do we do? We set this to zero and we see what we get. So from the first equation, what we get is that the first entry has to be equal to this. Okay. From the second equation, okay, from this second equation, what we get is that gamma, which is this value, uh, well, gamma is equal to this value. Gamma will be equal, um, so remember that we have this uh, condition on gamma that gamma has to be smaller or equal to 1 in absolute value so that um, the subgradient is actually a valid subgradient. Okay, this comes from the fact that here we're saying that these guys are valid um, subgradients of the L1 norm as long as in the entry where the coefficient estimate is equal to zero, the value is between minus one and one. Okay, so that's where that gamma came from. And now we have an expression of that gamma if this, the subgradient is equal to zero. So now from here, we simplify this by, by basically taking beta lasso one and just plugging it in there. Oops, that was a terrible arrow right there. We plug that in and we get this expression for, for gamma. And so now we need on the one hand uh, this guy to have a positive coefficient because that's what we assumed in the form of the gradient because it had a 1 in the first entry. And for that uh, we need lambda to be smaller than 1 plus x true, uh, so, so 1 plus the inner product between x true and z. And on the other hand we need the um, parameter gamma to be between minus one and one. And um, for that, from here, okay, you can see that this is a sufficient condition for that to happen. If these two conditions hold, then uh, we have that the subgradient is equal to zero, which means that um, the solution, like, which means that beta lasso 
equal to this beta 1 that is positive and 0 is a solution of the lasso cost function. Okay, so again, this might seem a little bit complicated and I, I encourage you to try and, um, you know, go through the computations at home. But the point is that the strategy is what's important. Here we did not have a closed form solution for the lasso coefficient estimate. So what we did is we wanted to understand under what conditions it would be sparse and it would have a non-zero, a positive non-zero entry in the first entry. We assumed that that was the case. We derived what would be the subgradient if that were the case. We uh, set that subgradient equal to zero and we realized that that would hold. So there would be a valid subgradient at that point that is equal to zero as long as lambda satisfies these two conditions. And this implies that if lambda satisfies those two conditions, indeed, the coefficient estimate with a non-zero in the first entry, a positive non-zero in the first entry, and zero in the second estimate is the unique solution to the lasso cost function. Similar techniques are actually used to uh, analyze sparse regression models and related models in the literature. Of course, with more complicated uh, models, because here we just had two features. So how, 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 what have we learned? We have learned how to analyze non-differentiable convex cost functions using subgradients. And we have hopefully gained a little bit of intuition about why the lasso works for a very simple example. And it comes down to the geometry of the cost function and how it interacts uh, with the least squares. Uh, so how the regularization term, the L1 norm regularization term, interacts with the least squares um, part of the cost function essentially uh, making the solutions, the minima of the cost function, fall onto, um, onto the axis so that they are sparse. Thank you very much.